uh, research, please feel free. I think uh, before we get into the program this evening, let's give a little bit of summation of some of the key points in our first two and sort of lead people into uh, what we're going to be doing. Indeed. Okay. Um, before Dave summarizes last week's show, which is actually more of a springboard for this show, let me explain very briefly some of the highlights of the first broadcast in this series. Again, this is a five-part series for those of you just starting off. And two weeks ago, uh, we opened up with a show that basically outlined the beginnings of the serious connection that is is essentially at the heart of this whole thing, the serious connection between fascist politics and the Vatican. Again, the distinction has to be made between the Catholic Church per se and the Vatican. The Vatican is an institution. It's also a country in its own right. And for many years, um, people involved at the highest reaches of the Vatican, and we do not accept the uh, the papal seat itself, um, have been actively involved in politics and far too often on the side of the extreme right. And we talked in the first show, again, just to talk very briefly, about, I'd say, about five important characters who are going to, in one way or another, influence everything we're talking about in the broadcast tonight. The first one that we talked about was a man by the name of Eugenio Pacelli, who, when the show opened, was contributing money in 1919 to the then nascent Nazi movement in Munich, and directly into the hands of Adolf Hitler, as a matter of fact, um, with the wishes that Hitler go out and do God's work against godless communism. That man, Eugenio Pacelli, eventually became Pope Pius, Pope Pius XII, the wartime pope, also the man who helped to negotiate and to sign, uh, before he became pope, the, the Lateran Treaty in 1929 with the Mussolini government, which separated um, Italy and the Vatican, the holy city, and gave the Vatican a lot more leeway financially and politically. A couple of key points is that not only was Eugenio Pacelli involved, but his brother Francesco handled a lot of the key legal negotiations on behalf of the Italian government. One of the, uh, as Nip pointed out, one of the outstanding results of the Lateran Treaty was not only diplomatic immunity for, uh, well, basically full diplomatic status for the Vatican and making Italy literally, or Catholicism literally, the state religion of Italy, but for our purposes uh, in this broadcast, perhaps most importantly, it uh, basically gave rise to what David Yallop, the author of In God's Name, and a book that we've used a lot and we'll be using again this evening and in weeks to come, uh, what, what David Yallop refers to as Vatican Incorporated, that is to say, the Vatican financial tangle, and at, that, at this point it has become a tangle, the chief institution being the IOR, the Institute for Religious Works, the so-called Vatican Bank. As a result of the Lateran Treaty, Mussolini tendered a, the, the, well, a hundred million dollars in 1929's currency, which is vastly, uh, a, a much, much larger sum today. As a result of that, the Vatican became a major business and financial interest. And the, uh, well, that, that start from the Lateran Treaty is one of the major uh, foci of this, these entire broadcasts, the Vatican Incorporated. Indeed. Now, two other characters who first come into play um, in the years during World War II, and uh, both of whom, one of whom especially, we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the first one uh, is a man who, in his actual given name at birth, was Giovanni Battista Montini. Um, we know him now as Pope Paul VI, but he first crops up in our broadcast as the man who, in the uh, in the documents, archives, and and uh, and papers center of the Vatican, when he was a cardinal, was in charge of handing out passports, many of which, and we have to assume it was with his knowledge, many of which went directly to Nazi war criminals of the highest order who used them to escape from Europe at the end of World War II. Because the Vatican had committed so strongly to anti-communism, they perforce became pro-Nazi, and they were responsible, not along with elements of American intelligence and the Nazi party, with getting Nazis out of Europe, and specifically through the passport office of Monsignor Montini. Now, this is significant because in the course of this, he came into contact with another man who's going to be very important in our broadcast tonight by the name of Licio Gelli. Licio Gelli, spelled G-E-L-L-L-I, the last name. Licio Gelli was a fascist functionary under Mussolini and has continued to this day, as far as we know, to be, be one of the biggest players in the fascist milieu all over the world. Also functioned as an SS intelligence agent, perhaps uh, equally as important as the Mussolini connection for our purposes. Absolutely. Licio Gelli was involved along with that Vatican office and with American intelligence in what we call the Rat Line, which is the, the actual underground rail Road that smuggled the Nazis out of Europe, mostly into South America, but a lot also into the Middle East, which we'll play somewhat tonight in our broadcast. Now, this rat line uh, was actually a, a sort of a, a, a group effort, I guess you could say. It was an operation which, from the financial standpoint, was largely funded by the SS itself. In our first program in the series, we looked at something called Operation Bernhard, which was an SS operation 
to forge American and primarily British banknotes, exchange them for real currency, and then use the proceeds from that operation to fund the Nazi Vatican exodus, well, the, the Vatican-assisted uh, Nazi exodus from Europe. Now, one of the organizations uh, involved with Operation Bernhard, it was a combination SS, Vatican, and U.S. intelligence operation. Uh, it's worth noting that, that uh, then-Cardinal Montini, later Pope Paul VI, had worked for the OSS, as we looked at in that program. He had actually worked uh, as, I guess you could say, a contract agent for American intelligence during World War II. Immediately afterward, he participates with Licio Gelli, former SS Oberleutnant, Mussolini functionary, founder and top dog, and we mean that literally, of the P2 Lodge. Licio Gelli, uh, according to David Yallop, was one of the principals in setting up the rat line. Uh, one of the key names with regard to the rat line, and who's a name we're going to crop up uh, against, to come up against this evening as well, is Friedrich Schwend, or Fritz Schwend. He was the, the main SS man behind Operation Bernhardt, which helped to fund the rat line. And uh, one of the key people also who fled via the rat line was a man named Klaus Barbie, and we're going to be coming up against him this evening. So what we're really looking at here is a melange, a melange of American intelligence, of the Vatican, of Nazi or Third Reich elements, of U, well, U.S. intelligence, as I said, and of the Propaganda Due Lodge, the secret Masonic lodge and crypto-fascist government founded by uh, Licio Gelli. In our second program, and I'll let Nip uh, develop this at uh, some length, I'm going to cop out. <laughs> um, in our second program, we saw this same melange basically developing the Vatican finances, which had accrued to Vatican Incorporated from the Lateran Treaty. We saw the P2 Lodge in the person particularly of Licio Gelli and a man named Umberto Ortolani, who we're going to touch back on this evening, uh, playing the key role in getting Montini elected Pope Paul VI. Montini then brings in P2 member Michele Sindona to help manage Vatican Incorporated. And, of course, we've looked at uh, U.S. involvement with those things last week. We're going to watch that whole melange, the same melange we saw with the rat line, with the P2, with Cardinal Montini and Pope Paul VI, U.S. intelligence, Klaus Barbie, Fritz Schwend, uh, Nazi elements both in Italy and abroad, U.S. intelligence, all of these things, again, we're not looking at one thing, but a, an, an entity which is composed of, I guess you could think of it sort of as a, 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 a pie, or various slices comprising the whole. And the same melange, beginning with the rat line, well, actually beginning with the, Vatic with the Vatican fascist associations, moving up to the rat line, and then moving up to... Uh, Vatican Incorporated and the manipulation of same, and we're going to see it develop some more this evening. Indeed. Now, as Dave mentioned, coming out of the first show, <clears throat> three more names that you need to know besides Licio Gelli that lead into the second show. Um, one of them, as Dave mentioned, Michele Sindona, another Roberto Calvi, and the last, a man by the name of Albino Luciani, who does not deserve to be remembered in such company, um, in such infamous company. Michele Sindona, of course, um, arch-fascist, arch-financial mogul, connected strongly to the Mafia, the CIA, and the Vatican. And again, the Mafia is another player in this thing. We told you this was going to get big, folks. Okay, um, we're going to get back to that in just a moment. I'm going to just finish uh, capping the names of the players here. Mica uh, Roberto Calvi sort of became Michele Sindona's second up. He followed Michele Sindona in Michele Sindona's role as arch financial advisor to the Vatican. Um, like Michele Sindona, although somewhat earlier than Sindona, met a rather messy end. Um, himself also, like Sindona, a key member of the P2, again, the Propaganda Due Masonic Lodge, which has very little to do with masonry, has a lot to do with fascist politics, and the personal agenda of Licio Gelli and his fascist cronies. So don't, <clears throat> don't mistake, as we said, don't mistake uh, talking about the Vatican for an attack on the Catholic Church. Don't mistake talking about the Propaganda Due Lodge for an attack on those nice guys who have the parades, you know, and stuff like that. We're not talking about the Masons per se. Exactly. Now, there are some Masonic lodges, and we're going to look at some corrupt uh, Masonic networks at the tail end of the broadcast this evening, but most Masons, you know, again, as Nip mentioned, they're, they're a charity organization, they're the civic organization, they raise money for hospitals and so forth, because it is uh, a, uh, oh, what, what, what's the word? Traditionally uh, secretive organization. Right. It, it, it can serve for people who would like to use it in such a fashion, people like Licio Jelly, as an ideal vehicle to establish a conspiratorial milieu. That is atypical, although it is a phenomenon we're going to look at this evening. But uh, as with the Vatican versus the Catholic Church, or the, as we cited in an earlier example, the uh, White House versus the United States, uh, there is a very close relationship between them, but the, the one is by no means equivalent to the other. Okay, now, as mentioned in the second broadcast, and I'll get to Albino Luciani in just a moment, as mentioned in the second broadcast, we, de we detailed the, the, the transfer over from uh, Pius XII to Paul VI. Remember, Paul VI, 
had been uh, when he was Cardinal Montini had been uh, involved very heavily, as far as we can tell, and all, all reliable sources say, with Licio Jelly and American intelligence in financing and, and arranging the rat line to get the Nazis out of, uh, out of Europe and into primarily South America. Now, one of the other things that Montini did when he became Pope Paul VI was to take people like Michele Sindona and basically turn over the operations of Vatican Incorporated, again, the major financial player the Vatican had become, um, such that we refer to it as Vatican Incorporated. Of course, again, like all these things, it's a huge web of financial contacts. But uh, when he became Pope Paul VI, he basically turned it over, um, the entire operation, to two people to begin with, I would say. Um, one of them is Archbishop Paul Marchinkus, the highest-ranking American in the Vatican, a uh, man originally born in Cicero, Illinois, known as Il Gorilla, and a man who is, uh, is, is at this point in so much trouble with the law that he cannot leave Vatican City because he is wanted by Italian authorities on about seven zillion counts of uh, various financial transgressions against the law. Um, uh, Pope Paul VI turned over the running of Vatican finance to Marcinkus and and also to Michele Sindona, whom he trusted very greatly. Remember again that P, that uh, Sindona's P2 masters, uh, Jelly and Ortolani, were instrumental in getting Montini elected Pope in the first place. That's right. And later on, Sindona brought his own protege, Calvi, into the operation. And when Sindona's massive operations began to fall apart, Calvi became the key player. And his bank, the Banco Ambrosiano, the largest private bank in Italy, was as even more intimately connected to P2 than even Sindona's organization probably was. Okay, so we have this this beginning to do. Vatican finance begins to extend outward. Uh, again, Marchinkus playing dumb all the way to official investigators, but obviously to, I think, any rational person looking at the evidence we presented last week, uh, Marchinkus was obviously very aware of what was going on. He was signing notes um, that were guaranteeing loans to dummy shell companies in Panama that were taking money and funneling them to fascist governments, as we're going to be talking about at some length this week. Receiving a uh, million dollars or so in stolen securities, or was it a, bil a billion in stolen securities? Nine hundred and fifty million dollars right. in stolen securities that were uh, that uh, unfortunately oh, forged, forged securities, forged, forged securities, forged by the mafia apparently for the Vatican. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, a really bizarre tangle, folks. Uh, Sindona, meanwhile, has got operations all over the world. One of which we're going to be talking about tonight at the very beginning of the broadcast. Uh, again, Roberto Calvi being brought along as a protege, and all together in this merry trio working on behalf of Pope Paul VI, getting the Vatican and its financial empire more and more involved with every variety of fascist politics known to man and the mafia, mafia drug running, gun running, things of this nature, and American intelligence. Murder in particular. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be looking at tonight uh, is the same uh, P2 Vatican U.S. intelligence Nazi axis involved in setting up death squads and terrorist incidents all over the world. Uh, what we're good, I guess you could say that uh, as as with this evening's broadcast, the merry-go-round really begins to turn. We're going to be looking at the same tangle involved in international affairs. We're going to be looking at P2, which has been primarily a uh, Vatican and Italian player so far, as an international power force. And, okay, following the long and besmirched reign of Pope Paul VI, we talked about the fact that the man elected to become the Pope, and named himself Pope John Paul I, was a man by the name of of Albino Luciani. Albino Luciani had been the uh, the legate, I guess the um, uh, I just forgot the name, but he was the uh, official official manage the cardinal in charge of uh, of Venice. I'm trying to think of the, oh, of the, the actual the, the, name. The, oh gosh, not not the prelate. Or, no, uh, but uh, it, pa patriarch of Venice. Yes, the patriarch of Venice, Albino Luciani. Uh, Luciani had already come into contact with Marcinkus's, Sindona's, and Calvi's financial maneuverings when the Banca Cattolica del Veneto was taken over by Marcinkus on behalf of Michele Sindona and, and Roberto Calvi. Right. Okay. Right. So, and he had already gone to the Vatican, uh, Luciani, when he was still just a cardinal, to complain about these things and been told, basically, well, Pope Paul VI has given them free hand, and you better just get out of the way so you don't get stepped on. And it's worth noting that the uh, Banca Cattolica was taken over, essentially because that was to be the only truly valuable property in a huge, uh, basically, paper conglomerate being put together by Sindona in order to defraud uh, not only private investors, but also, specifically, the state of Italy of a great deal of money. In fact, that pattern which we looked at, uh, well, actually it underlay the whole uh, involvement of Calvi and Sindona because the Italian government could not afford the uh, loss of revenue from the tax-free status of the Vatican's dividend, or the, the dividends 
uh, accruing to Vatican Incorporated. So the Vatican began to divest itself of Italian holdings so it could invest abroad and escape Italian taxes. This led to all sorts of things which were disastrous for the Italian economy. And the same pattern we'll be seeing uh, in, in this evening as well, where uh, basically this whole tangle is going to come up d at direct loggerheads with the Italian government. That's right. So Luciani, the patriarch of Venice, is involved himself in, in, a, dis in a disapproving way in one small part of this immense financial scam that is going on with Sindona and Calvi and Marcinkus using the assets of the Vatican. And we described in some detail, although not as much as we thankfully could have if we had desired to, um, the, the kinds of scams involved. And this involved taking one shell company and uh, inflating its value dramatically and then taking another company, still owned but distantly by the same conglomerate, the Sindona-Calvi conglomerates, um, because both of them did this with their own companies, buying that shell company at a hugely inflated price so that the shareholders of the company buying their own company without realizing it were paying way over value and then Sendona or Calvi or whoever else was involved would pocket the profits and the whole the whole uh, this shell company would basically crumble but money had been made the shareholders had lost the money we also talked about about dodging import duties overvaluing imports and undervaluing exports and or is it the other way around it goes on and on and on now Luciani became Pope. The first thing that Luciani didn't remember, he only reigned for 33 days as John Paul I. The first order of business he had was to get rid of Paul Marcinkus, head of the Vatican Bank, the IOR, uh, the Institute for Religious Works, to get rid of Marcinkus to pull the, the bank out of the hands of people like Calvi and Sindona and to put the Vatican back in the position that he felt it should be, which was a religious example to the world and not a fascist money-making machine. And at the very end of the last broadcast, we talked about how, under very bizarre circumstances, um, and owing largely to the work of David Yallop, from what we were working on, uh, what we were reading from, um, how Albino Luciani, John Paul I, was found dead in his bedroom. Um, the circumstances of his death were immediately uh, altered radically, by Cardinal Vio, who was at that time uh, the Camerlengo, or the head of the, the, the Vatican premises at that time, uh, took a lot of articles, hid them, took all the papers having to do with the changes that John Paul I was going to make, uh, took them out of the hands of the dead man and hid them, um, et cetera, et cetera, then denied an autopsy, embalmed the body, called for the embalmers, as a matter of fact, before they even called the rest of the people in the Vatican hierarchy, a variety of very bizarre circumstances, and as a result, uh, John Paul I, of course, was not able to begin to, Im to, uh, to uh, put into a the changes in the Vatican financial mess. Now, it should be remembered, too, that Cardinal Vio was the head of an organization called APSA, which was one of the main Vatican organs, uh, well, one of the main organs involved with Vatican Incorporated, as Yala puts it, and Vio was going to be replaced because of this association by the late, unfortunate, Albino Luciani. So uh, his curious behavior in, in uh, obfuscating the circumstances of Luciani's death, or of JP1's death, is interesting because very few, well, no one benefited more than Cardinal Vio. So. That's right. And, of course, the death of John Paul I, after only 30 33 days, um, a man who is in direct opposition, and in fact, the sworn enemy of the Sindonas, the Calvis, and the Marchinkuses, uh, brought in John Paul II, the formal car Cardinal Karl Votila, um, the Polish Cardinal Karl, Karl Votila, who himself has a very bizarre background, which we won't go into too deeply, um, uh, some many unexplained questions about his doings during World War II. Um, he himself got involved. Um, one of the first things he did was brought in some dyed-in-the-wool fascists, and there's no other way to say it, to over oversee um, the Vatican Bank's problems. They quickly gave the Vatican, uh, Vatican Inc. a clean bill of health. Um, Votila himself has this kind of a strange background, and he fe features so prominently, of course, in this, because he is the man at whom shots were fired and some struck during 1981, that he's the, the hub in many ways of this whole wheel, and his position is still something that we are working on. So we're not going to go into too much detail, but of course he is the man who is Pope now. And that's what we're talking about, and that brings us pretty much up to the beginning of tonight's broadcast. Now, uh, as uh, mentioned at the top of the broadcast, with this evening's broadcast, for those of you who are wondering why this is called the Mediterranean Merry-Go-Round, the, Medi the Merry-Go-Round is going to begin to spin this evening. We're going to be looking at the international connections of this whole P2 complex, and by that we mean the Vatican, U.S. intelligence, Third Reich elements, as well as the P2 itself with its organized crime connections. We're going to take a look at their international doings. We're going to begin looking at them as an international force. Many of the elements that we're going to be introducing this evening will figure directly in the story of the actual shooting of Pope John Paul II that we'll be getting into in the last two broadcasts. But we're going to start this evening in North America. From North America, we're going to move to Italy. 
in and and, uh, and Europe in general, primarily Italy. Then from Italy and Europe, we're going to move to Latin America. And after uh, our sojourn in Latin America, we're going to swing back north to the United States again. So we're going to start in America, to Europe, to Latin America, and back up to North America. Absolutely. Unless those of you out there are thinking, oh, yeah, big talk, but what about the Middle East and Africa and the rest of the world? Next week. Next week. Okay. Starting off with a section from The Great Heroin Coup, subtitled Drugs, Intelligence, and International Fascism. This is a book that was published in 1980 by South End Press. The author's name is Heinrich or Henrik Kruger, K-R-U-G-E-R. Excellent book. We used it quite a bit. He is talking, of course, about Michele Sindona. Again, remember, not only the Vatican's top financial advisor, but uh, one of the main links between the mafia and the CIA, and a man who had his fingers until recently, when he died, in more, more illegal and illicit financial pies than practically anyone can imagine. Now, one of the things that we looked at in our second broadcast was the... A uh, very cushy lifestyle that Michele Sindona was able to lead in the United States, even after he was a fugitive from justice in Italy, uh, while the Vatican uh, finances were tumbling all about the uh, ears of not only Sindona but Roberto Calvi, and while a lot of people began tumbling uh, from windows and bridges and other places, including eventually Calvi, his secretary, and a lot of other people we haven't got time to mention... Uh, Michele Sindona was holding forth at places like Columbia Business School, the Wharton School in Philadelphia, and uh, expounding on the uh, myriad wonders of being a high and successful, a uh, successful international financier. In and business my... ethics. Right, and business ethics in particular. And uh, it, was, it was a source of great outrage to the Italian authorities that Sindona was able to uh, affect such a, uh, a pretentious and genteel lifestyle in the United States when he was basically a heinous criminal and a probable murderer. Uh, the connections in North America that, that Kruger is going to cite here to, to begin with are going to help explain some of that. Okay, reading from the great heroine coup. Sindona's connections to the presidential administration of Richard Nixon are more firmly established. Sindona's Italian banks were investment partners with a continental Illinois bank headed by David Kennedy, Nixon's first treasury secretary, and a director of FASCO International, Sindona's Luxembourg-based holding company. Sindona's interests were represented in the United States by Mudge, Rose, Guthrie, and Alexander, the law firm of Nixon's attorney general, John Mitchell. In Italy, Sindona orchestrated the efforts of the neo-fascist deputy Luigi Turchi to garner Italian support for Nixon's election campaign. Sindona even offered $1 million on condition of anonymity to creep, that was of course the committee to re-elect the president, for those of you who don't remember that stuff, to creep treasurer Maurice Stans. The offer was refused. While Sindona was out vescoing Robert Vesco himself, the CIA was exploiting Sindona's far-right political sympathies and connections in Italy. According to the House of Representatives Pike Report on CIA activities, Sindona was a key channel for the millions distributed by the agency to centrist and right-wing Italian political parties, affiliated organizations, and candidates. Part of the payoff helped finance an abortive fascist coup in December 1970. And we're going to be talking a lot about that, folks. Another portion was allocated to the fascist strategy of tension, something else we're going to be talking a lot about, in which Italian intelligence officers and neo-fascists conspired to shift Italian voters rightward through bombings that were attributed to leftists, including the 1969 explosion at Milan's Piazza Fontana, which claimed 17 lives. A key figure in the 1969 bombing and the 1970 coup attempt was the Italian Stefano Della Chiai. I'm going to spell that for those of you out there who are interested. It's uh, small d e l l e, and another word, capital C H I A I E. And it's worth remembering this guy too. He's going to be one of the major players for the remaining three of our broadcasts. As we go to press, Kruger writes, we find confirmation of his role in the 1975 attempted assassination of Bernardo Leighton. Bernardo Leighton was an important Chilean uh, center centrist politician. Uh, in the 1979 attempted assassination of Bernardo Leighton in Rome. In John Dingus's and Saul, Landau, Saul Landau's penetrating book, Assassination on Embassy Row, published by 1980 by Pantheon. Della Chiai had been contacted for the hit by Michael Townley of the Chilean DINA, that's their secret police, and Virgilio Paz of the Miami and Union City, New Jersey based Cuban nationalist movement. Okay, so just real quickly here, what we've got going on is a variety of things. We've got Sindona contacted into Mudge, Rose, Guthrie, and Alexander. Okay, uh, John Mitchell's law, law, office. We've also got him connected in with uh, actually uh, working to support Nixon in Italy, something that's kind of going to sound a little familiar by the end of the broadcast when we talk about some of the work that Licio Gelli did for um, another Republican president. 
Um, we're also talking about the, the connections, uh, the beginnings of connections here that we're going to be examining tonight for the December coup of 1970 and the strategy of tension, very important things, and, of course, in the service of those particular operations, Stefano Della Chiai, who's got to be one of the most uh, profound uh, right-wing terrorist in the world today and is involved with more things than you can count. But the things that they're mentioning here, again, are his contacts not only to the Chilean secret police, which is very important for the Nixon and CIA connections, because, of course, the CIA um, helped to put the Chilean secret police into the position that they're in even today, um, with the 1973 coup against Salvador Allende, but also the uh, the Cuban exile movement, which of course played such a strong part in the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Watergate and a variety of other American domestic political operations. Now we're going to turn our attention to the strategy of tension. Now remember, as we explain what this is, the strategy strategy of tension basically is a terrorist program in Italy that was funded in considerable measure by the Central Intelligence Agency through Michele Sindona, among others. Now, the strategy of tension and the principles involved in it are going to be uh, front and center for the, not only the rest of the discussion this evening, a lot of which will focus on terrorism made to look like terrorism from the other side, but this is going to be a prominent thing in considering the assassination of Pope John Paul II, and we're going to take a look at that incident, basically, as a form of provocation. About the strategy of tension and Del Stefano Della Chiai's role in it, there's a good account of uh, the strategy of tension itself in a book called The Nazi Legacy, subtitled Klaus Barbie and the International Fascist Connection. It was uh, authored by three people, three British journalists, Magnus Linklater, Isabel Hilton, and Neil Asherson, A-S-C-H-E-R-S-O-N. Copyright 1984, published in hardcover in the United States with, by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston of New York. And in the Nazi legacy, as I said, there's an excellent description of Stefano Della Chiai and his pivotal role in establishing the strategy of tension, unquote. And the principles, the uh, realpolitik principles involved in this are front and center in the discussion for the next three weeks. From the Nazi legacy. It was during lengthy discussions with Guerin Sarac, that's Yves Guerin Sarac, a prominent fascist mercenary who worked with Della Chiai. It was during lengthy discussions with Guerin Sarac that Della Chiai and his comrades began to develop a new political theory known as the strategy of tension, unquote. It was not, perhaps, the most original idea of its time, but it was later dressed up as something profound, a serious contribution to the ideology of the right. The idea was that if acts of terrorism were carried out and then blamed on left-wing groups, they might gradually lead to the kind of instability that threatened the democratic state. If this continued long enough the army might finally be encouraged to step in and take over, thus laying the ideal breeding ground for fascism, a military dictatorship. Quote, Our belief is that the first phase of political activity ought to be to create the conditions favoring the installation of chaos in all the regime's structures, unquote, read one of Delacchiai's favorite passages. Again, quoting, In our view, the first move we should make is to destroy the structure of the democratic state under the cover of communist activities. Unquote. In Italy, he began to organize the infiltration of left-wing groups, encouraging his fascist colleagues to grow their hair long and join anarchist groups which would then be encouraged to stir up trouble. Initially, at any rate, the tactics seemed to succeed. In April of 1969, explosions at Padua University and later at the Milan Industrial Fair organized by the right were immediately blamed on left-wing anarchists. On August 8, 1969, ten bombs were placed on trains running from several mainline stations in Italy. Eight of them exploded, though since the trains were half empty, only ten people were injured. Again, the left was blamed, and something like hysteria began to creep into media coverage of what was seen as a well-organized campaign of subversion. Then, on December 12th, a massive explosion ripped through the foyer of the Banca dell'Agricultura on the Piazza Fontana in Milan, just a few steps away from the great cathedral of that city, killing 16 people. In Rome, 25 minutes after the Milan explosion, another bomb went off, wounding 14 passers-by, and half an hour after that, again in Rome, two more bombs exploded in the Piazza Venezia, causing great damage but no casualties. The bombings were greeted with horror in Italy and throughout Europe. Coming as they did in the wake of the student demonstrations of 1968, they were seen as evidence that the left would stick at nothing to achieve their ends. But within three days, a significant ar arrest had been made. Pietro Valpreda, a former ballet dancer and leader of a left-wing anarchist group, was picked up by the police and charged with having organized the Piazza Fontana bombing in Milan. 
Over the next few days, about 150 anarchists or anarchist suspects were hauled in for questioning by police. The arrest of Valpreda and his comrades was a perfect illustration of the strategy of tension in action. For unknown to any of the investigators, all the bombings from the Padua explosion to the outrage at the Piazza Fontana had been the work of right-wing groups organized by Della Chiai and his friends. Valpreda had been framed. It would be 13 years before the Italian courts were finally able to determine that Valpreda was innocent and to issue warrants instead for the arrest of Della Chiai and other members of the Avangardia Nazionale. But oddly enough, there was one discreet organization which did know right away. The Servizio Informazioni Difesa, or SID, Italy's main secret service agency had already noted that Della Chiai seemed to have close connections with the police and had recorded him as being, quote, an informer of the Rome Central Police, unquote, with contacts in the Ministry of the Interior. Five days after the Piazza Fontana bombing, the SID circulated a note to their branch offices stating flatly that Della Chiai had organized all the attacks and that the man who had actually planted the bombs was Della Chiai's closest lieutenant, Mario Merlino, who had also infiltrated Valpreda's anarchist group. It then went on to note Della Chiai's links with Yves guerin serac in a report which concluded that Merlino and Della Chiai committed the attacks in order, to, in order to place responsibility on other groups, unquote. It may seem strange that these suspicions were not immediately passed on to the Italian judiciary. If they had been, the career of a dangerous black terrorist could have been brought to a swift conclusion. By the way, uh, interjecting here, black terrorist means fascist as opposed to red, which uh, stands in uh, Italian political shorthand for communist and black for fascist. Continuing. But it is now clear that the SID considered Della Chiai extremely useful, both as a source of information on the left, which he had successfully infiltrated, and as an agent provocateur. Just as Klaus Barbie was valued by the American CIC, that's Counterintelligence Corps, for his expertise in counterintelligence and his ability to recruit informers, so Della Chiai was a man to be kept quietly on the books rather than turned over to the law. So uh, the two key points to make here is that Stefano Della Chiai, a dyed-in-the-wool fascist, was seeking a strategy, formed a strategy, and then pursued a strategy of creating terrorist incidents, provocations to be blamed on the left, which in turn would precip precipitate a military coup and the establishment, basically, of a fascist dictatorship. In so doing, he was not only not disciplined by the authorities, but functioned as an informer and agent provocateur for the state security service. And as we're going to look at, that state security service had some interesting connections. All right, reading now from a book entitled St. Peter's Banker by Luigi DeFonzo last name, capital D-I, capital F-O-N-Z-O, published by Franklin Watts in 1983. On December 12, 1969, a number of innocent people discovered the power of terrorism when a bomb exploded at the Bank of Agriculture in the Piazza Fontana in Milan. Moments later, another went off in Rome's National Bank of Labor just off the Via Veneto. A third bomb exploded at the monument of King Victor Emmanuel II. Altogether, 16 people were killed and another 90 were wounded. At first, the bombings were blamed on the left. An official of the Movimento Sociale Italiano, MSI, the neo-fascist party, declared the acts a crisis for the whole system of government and called for, quote, civil war. In response, new fascist groups, the New Order, the Black Order, the Mussolini Action Squad, the Steel Helmet, and the Third Position, to the right of MSI, sprang up and began their armed struggle. In an attempt to contain the violence, Police arrested 70 anarchists and searched the home of the wealthy left-wing publisher Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli. Though no evidence was found that could tie Feltrinelli to the bombings, he was later ordered to stand trial on charges of criminal incitement in connection with the September 1968 police seizure from Feltrinelli's bookstores of paint spray bottles inscribed, Paint Your Policeman Yellow. Another leftist by the name of Pinelli died after he mysteriously fell, or was tossed, from the third floor window of a police station. Later, however, it was discovered that the massacre of December 12th was probably the work of the extreme right. And I should just cut in to interject here. It was definitely the work of the extreme right. Police traced the bombings to three neo-fascists, among them General Guido Genettini, an agent of the SID at Italy's Secret Service and a high-ranking member of Licio Gelli's P2. It is believed that Giannettini was head of a faction within P2 known as the Third Position. Okay, and we're going to hear about them later, by the way. This is Nip injecting. Uh, terza Posizione. This faction, says journalist Thomas Sheehan, advocates what is called Nazi Maoism. Sheehan goes on to say that the Third Position, or Terza Posizione, aligns itself with the political beliefs of Hitler, Peron, Mao, and Gaddafi. 
Its slogans include, Long Live the Fascist Dictatorship of the Proletariat, and Hitler and Mao United in Struggle. Okay, quick quick points to make real uh, important points. Um, again, they in this particular article, I mean, book, uh, DeFonso talks about how um, in response to these bombings, the Piazza Fontana and all the others, that these uh, new fascist groups to the right of the uh, the uh, MSI party, the neo-fascist party, sprang up and began their armed struggle. Now, it should be pointed out that Stefano Della Chiai and some of the others that he is affiliated with were also affiliated with all of these groups. And Stefano Della Chiai was the person who was responsible, uh, in a large part, for the Piazza Fontana bombing. So this, these are not groups that are reacting honestly um, with armed struggle to threats of revolution. These are groups that knew in advance that these bombs are going to be going off. Again, this is part of the strategy of tension. This is part of the whole plan, um, again, to to foment revolution, to blame it on the left, and to give the uh, the brown shirts and the black shirts, in the case of Italy, a chance to get out into the streets and start beating people up and throwing people out of police station windows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is all planned. Now, again, we're going to be coming back to Gaddafi and Terza Posizioni and the Middle Eastern and African connections to this whole Mediterranean merry-go-round next week. So st uh, stash Gaddafi, stash Terza Posizioni, we'll be back to them next week. A couple of the key points, about, again, before we proceed with this with the, this whole tangle of events. The Piazza Fontana bombing and the other terrorist incidents of the strategy of tension conceived by Stefano Della Chiai to discredit the left and create a military coup from the right. P2 member and... Uh, and Italian Secret Service agent G uh, Guido Giannatini is one of the key people involved with the Piazza Fontana bombing. And it's worth noting that, uh, as I said, a key member not only of the Secret Service, but also of Licio Gelli's P2. The CIA is very much involved with setting up the strategy of tension, P2 member Michele Sindona being one of the conduits for money to, to uh, precipitate that incident. And keep in mind, Guido Giannatini, we're going to talk about him in connection with another intelligence service, the BND of West Germany, later in the broadcast. As we begin looking at the P2 and at the Italian intelligence service's role in subversion, it might be, in fact, it is, uh, we feel, essential to review a little bit of the history of the development of the Italian intelligence services, and this in turn is inextricably linked with the strategy of tension and with the history of fascist subversion in Italy. For our, uh, I guess you could say, thumbnail synopsis of the development of Intel uh, Italian intelligence, we're going to be turning to a magazine called Middle East Magazine. It's a respectable publication, obviously dealing with Middle Eastern power politics. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the issue of Middle East of July of 1981. Research credit for this article goes to Ted Rubenstein, an excellent researcher who's been working with us for many years and whose work is going to be front and center in the broadcast this evening, along with that of his co-worker, Jonathan Marshall, who provided a lot of the translations that we're going to be using during the uh, remaining three programs. Jonathan is currently the editorial page editor for the Oakland Tribune. Now, in the Middle East issue of July of 1981, we're going to be looking at an article called Italy's Secret Service Wars. And uh, there is no journalistic credit. Oh, it says basically, uh, Paolo Caligaris is the author of, uh, well, basically the Middle East correspondent uh, who is, is uh, pr providing the information for this article. Like most Western security services, the Italian agency rose from the ashes of its predecessor soon after World War II. For 20 years, internal and external intelligence had been controlled by the Mussolini regime. When the agency was reorganized under the auspices of the U.S. and U.K., efficiency was considered more important than the establishment of political democracy. I would interject that's a pattern we've seen many times before. From the outset, therefore, Italy's secret service, Servizio Informazioni Forze Armate, Armed Forces Information Services, or CIFAR, became the responsibility of those who had held the same or similar posts under fascism. The extreme right-wing character of this agency became clear in the early 1960s when, under Carabinieri General Giovanni De Lorenzo, CIFAR was found to have been working against Italy's democratic institutions, which had been experimenting with the first center-left coalition by in including the Socialist Party in Christian democratic-controlled governments. This was against the wishes of the Central Intelligence Agency, which was acting as a kind of mother house for the Italian service. Di Lorenzo's plot, which was supported by the right-wing sectors of the establishment, failed mainly because of revelations in the authoritative liberal magazine, L'Espresso. Oh, hey, why don't you uh, continue reading here, Nip, while I handle our tape. Oh, uh, right there, L'Espresso. Okay. After a trial, Sifar was disbanded, and Di Lorenzo became a member of parliament representing the neo-fascist Italian social movement, MSI. We talked about them earlier. The Servizio Informazione Difesa, 
the Defense Information Service, otherwise known as SID, replaced CIFAR. But again, most of its old personnel were retained, and its right-wing tendencies increased. In December 1969, the bombing of the Milan Banca del Agricultura killed 17 and signaled what was seen as a terrorist strategy to destabilize the country. It was immediately blamed on the new left, on the new left organizations, which had sprung up in the late 1960s, and a wave of arrests followed. But, after various trials, many of the charges were found to be baseless, and investigations by journalists, trade unions, and individuals proved that this and other attacks were the work of the extreme right, acting with the assistance of the SID. Again, remember, the SID, the Italian Secret Service, Intelligence Service. Skipping on down in the article. Under Premier Giulio Andreotti, who favored closer relations with the Arabs and an independent Italian role in Middle East affairs, SID was dissolved. In an attempt to avoid further involvement of the intelligence apparatus in right-wing conspiracies, Andreotti in 1977 established two separate services, one civilian, officially in charge of internal security, and one in charge and one military, officially in charge of external espionage and counter-espionage. The theory was that one agency would watch the other to neutralize anti-institutional conspiracies by either. But, from the start, the Servizio Informazione Sicurezza Democratica, Democratic Security Information Service, otherwise known as CISDE, S-I-S-D-E, under General Giulio Grassini, was relegated to a subordinate role compared with the Servizio Informazione Sicurezza Militare, the Military Security Information Service, CISMI. S-I-S-M-I. You're going to hear that name a lot. That's SISMI. Let me just run that one down for you one more time. That is the Military Security Information Service, SISMI, under General Giuseppe Santovito.